Well, for those of us here, we can uh, turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Again, so blessed to have you with us this morning. Hope you've had a good week. Hope you're enjoying this cooler weather. So we've been preaching in the book of Acts for several weeks, and we've learned a lot about the first century church. We know that the early church was predominantly Jewish. We also know that, uh, that the early church, those Jews, they, they had no uh, uh, intention, no uh, idea, no thought that God was going to open up his eternal kingdom uh, to the Gentiles and certainly their enemy, the Samaritans. So, uh, so we're learning a lot about the, uh, the expanse of the church, the inclusiveness of the church, and, and that uh, certainly... Uh, God intended for uh, all men to have the opportunity to accept his son as uh, Lord and Savior. After Pentecost, Peter uh, preached throughout Jerusalem, and there were many added to the church. The church at Jerusalem was growing uh, quickly initially. One can only imagine what the, what the uh, excitement must have been throughout Jerusalem as you're seeing all these people convert to uh, Christianity and the excitement that they had being uh, born again. Uh, under, under the shed blood of Jesus Christ, having accepted the, the arrival of the Messiah. The tremendous response by the Jews as well as the Gentiles resulted in the religious leaders becoming envious and jealous of the apostles. And it wasn't too long before we read about the stoning of Stephen and the church coming under severe persecution. Uh, this seems to be the manner in which the uh, early ministry of the church would progress. They would experience some great success, followed by some great persecution. As a result of the church's persecution, we read where Philip, and along with the other disciples that had spread out, uh, but Philip went to Samaria. Once there, he began to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the response of the people of Samaria were so uh, bountiful that scripture said that the city was filled with great joy. After experience, uh, experiencing such success in Samaria, we again read where Satan had a plan to try to undermine the workings of the church. There was a man by the name of Simon. He was a sorcerer, a magician, um, and as he witnessed the power of Peter and the other disciples as they were uh, bestowing the gift of the Holy Ghost on new believers. Scripture says that he too believed. But it wasn't very long until Simon would reveal his true heart as he offered money to Peter if he would give him the secret or the ability to gift uh, people with the uh, Holy Ghost. And of course we know that Peter strongly admonished Simon for his, his worldly heart, uh, but we see another instance. Uh, following great success of the church, how did Satan will use someone to kind of try to undermine it? What, what would have happened if, if uh, uh, Peter would have been tempted to do such a thing? Uh, for monetary gain, to, of course he couldn't do it, but you know what I mean. Uh, Simon would have come in there and he would have undermined the whole intention, the whole base of what the gospel was intended to do in saving people. In Caesarea, Peter met with Cornelius, and he led many uh, of the Gentiles to the Lord. When Peter returned to Jerusalem, uh, the Jews in the church confronted Peter for having, uh, having sat down and, and eaten with the Gentiles, and certainly for leading them to the Lord. Again, we see an instance where a great work had been done for the kingdom, only to have it uh, followed by opposition. When Peter went into the home of Cornelius and preached to those people, he knew that it would not be welcome news to his Jew, uh, Jewish brothers and sisters uh, back in Jerusalem. So it's hard not to think that Peter uh, may have been robbed of some of the great joy that should have been experienced uh, for seeing so many people come to the Lord, Gentile or not, uh, having one of the, someone of the lost, uh, an unbeliever, come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ is reason to rejoice and to shout. So instead of uh, basking in the glory of God's blessing, we read that, that Peter was rehearsing in his mind what he would say to those in the church back home. So, you know, he, he's had the opportunity to lead these people uh, to the Lord. Uh, we're seeing a new, uh, kind of a new uh, revelation of the new church as it's opened up to the Gentiles, and he should be, he should be rejoicing in that. Well, he's rehearsing in his mind because he knows when he gets back to Jerusalem, there's going to be, uh, uh, you know, probably confrontation. And that always takes the edge off of anyone's joy and peace when they know that there's trouble coming. In the 12th chapter, we read where Herod had beheaded James, the brother of John, and had taken Peter prisoner. 
throughout the periods of successful ministry, Satan continued his overt attack on the church of God. Regardless of the persecution, we read in Acts 12, 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. That's a powerful statement. When you think, listen, if you, if you really get into what the first century church was going through, how that they were, this was all new to them. I mean, we grew up in the church, most of us. And you grow up in the church, that's one thing. But to have this, uh, this new revelation come forth and all the things they were trying to learn and the persecution that they were enduring and to know that the word of God was growing means they were being faithful to their calling. In the 13th chapter of Acts, we read where the church, led by the Holy Ghost, sent Barnabas and Saul on a missionary journey to spread the gospel throughout the earth. Once more, God's word was prospering when Barnabas and Saul landed in Paphos and where they encountered a, a sorcerer by the name of Bar-Jesus who went by Elimus. Elimus being a, an Aramaic translation of, for the word magician. Elimus was the magician in the governor's court. This man's name was Sergius Paulus. And he had heard Paul and Barnabas speak, and he had inquired of them, said, can I hear some more? The Bible describes him as an intelligent man. I want to hear more. I want to hear more of what you've got to say. I want to understand about this gospel. And when they began to, uh, to minister to him, to uh, witness to him, this Elimus began to contend with them. And his contention with them was for the sole purpose of preventing uh, Sergius Paulus from becoming a Christian. Why? Because he was wanting to preserve his position of influence within the king's court. That's what uh, I, I'm just sure of. And so because we're seeing it through all the, the, the opposition in the church, most of it is, is uh, uh, selfishly motivated. But from Paphos, Paul and Barnabas landed in Antioch of Pisidia, where again, the word of God was met with tremendous success only to garner the ire of the religious rulers. As was his custom, Paul had gone into the synagogue to share the gospel with the Jews first. Some believed, and the Gentiles begged Paul and Barnabas to share the word with them the following week. When they did, we are told that almost the whole city came out to hear the word of God. When the religious rulers saw what was happening, they became jealous of Paul and Barnabas. And so they went, we read in uh, the 30th or the 50th verse, devout and honorable women. So they went to the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But what we read in verses 51 and 52 is extremely encouraging. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. And we learn a couple things here. Number one, we learn that when the word of God was rejected and his ministers were persecuted, when they left, they shook off the dust of their feet. This act was symbolic of their desire to maintain the purity of, of their religion, to remain uh, to the purity of their church. And I forget which group it is. I don't know if it's a uh, Jehovah's Witness or whatever, but uh, there's a group out there when they go door knocking, whatever, and if they're rejected, when they get to the end of your driveway, they tap the, the, your dust, the dust from your uh, property off their feet because they don't want to carry it out with them. Uh, there's a lesson there. Someday maybe we'll be able to preach on that as well. But what we have to understand is that there is going to come a point in time where you will cease uh, sharing the gospel with someone. Whether, uh, whether you temporarily uh, uh, back off or if there's a permanent uh, cessation in that. Over in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7 and the 6th verse, Jesus told us this, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. We aren't to give that which is holy to those that aren't going to receive it as holy, respect it as holy, uh, treat it as holy. We can go into the presence of some that if they're in a certain condition, that they're just not going to hear anything you got to say. You're wasting your time. Your time would be better spent elsewhere. You can come back to them when they're in a better uh, frame of mind or a better ability to understand. Secondly, we also read that the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. 
What we see here is that despite the persecution and rejection of God's words, the disciples didn't focus on their disappointment for being persecuted. Instead, they focused on the blessings that God had bestowed upon them. I can tell you that this pattern of ministry holds true today. We can see a great thing happen in the Lord only to be followed by some type of persecution by Satan. We can have a tremendous service. We can have a friend day service or, a, or a, uh, uh, our, our special Sunday, I forget what we called it now, uh, where we all gave testimonies. We can have a service like that where you can feel the spirit moving. And then next thing you know, Satan's going to come in there. Because Satan wants to disrupt. He wants to discourage. He wants to destroy. And let me tell you what. If you're sitting here today and you're thinking that you're too, too good of a Christian to, uh, to become under the assault of Satan, you, you are lying to yourself. And if you're sitting here today and you've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you better understand something. You're on Satan's hit list. And he's going to come at you with everything he has. He's going to, he's going to look at you. He's going to find your weakness. And he's, I, I, I describe Satan like water. Water will find the path of least resistance and it will infiltrate. And when it gets there, it will begin to decay and to rot and to destroy. That's what Satan does. He finds out what your weakness is and he comes in, whatever that weakness is, and he lays there and he begins to decay and to rot and to destroy. That's his whole purpose, is to try to uh, discourage you from uh, your walk and your journey with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Today, we're going to look at the continuing events of Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey. And we're going to see this pattern of ministry continue. So this morning I'm going to preach a message. I've just called it a, t a pattern of ministry. And we're in Acts chapter 14. I'll ask you to stand with me. We'll read a few verses this morning. Beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, this morning for your word and for uh, the witness of of uh, Paul and Barnabas, Lord, that despite the persecution, despite uh, the opportunity for discouragement and frustration and aggravation and all these things, that they continue to preach the gospel. Lord, may we be faithful to the call on our lives, Lord, to preach the gospel, to share the gospel, to uh, be a witness into a lost and dying world. May your word embolden us this morning. May it encourage us uh, this morning to do exactly that, to be a strong willing servant of Jesus Christ. We ask it in your name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> Despite Paul and Barnabas' exile from Antioch, Pisidia, they didn't allow that to discourage them in their ministry. And while we do see a pattern to ministry that encounters constant or at least consistent opposition, we must also take note that there's a pattern of resolve in ministry as well. Successful ministries don't give up. Successful ministries push on. Successful ministries don't allow Satan to uh, get away with some of his stunts uh, because we have power over Satan. You know? You have all the power over Satan that you need to defeat him. The Bible is absolutely clear of that. The only power that Satan has in your life is the power that you've turned over to him. Amen? Amen. I want us to understand that. Back in the fourth, first verses, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. So when they left Antioch, the city, Paul and Barnabas, they traveled about 80 miles southeast to Iconium. Once there, they entered into the synagogue, and as we talked last week, any town or city that had 10 adult males would have a synagogue. And uh, the thing that was good about that, as far as from Paul's perspective, would have been 
uh, Paul as a trained rabbi, when he would enter into a synagogue, it was tradition that if you had any uh, rabbis in your presence, any, any guests, that they would be offered the opportunity to speak. So Paul knew going into the synagogue that uh, he was going to get the opportunity to address the congregation. So he always had an end. So Luke records that Paul so spake that there was a multitude of Jews and Greeks that believed. Paul must have been quite the orator. He spoke in such a manner that people were able to understand the gospel, to be convicted by the gospel, and to receive the gospel. I've sat in services where uh, there's been these preachers, these old, back, you know, you know, I keep, it's hard for me to think of myself as being old. So, you know, back in the day, you know, I still had occasion where we had a couple of those old time hackers, you know, you know, you know, and all that. Amen. I'm not the only one here that was old enough to remember that. But anyway, you had these, these hackers, right? Well, the problem sometimes was that some of these guys, they would speak so loud and, uh, and, and hacking so much, and they would get going so fast, you couldn't understand anything they said. And that, that's, not, that's not a good thing. But then on the other side of the fence, uh, I've been in services where uh, the guy was more sophisticated. He stood behind the pulpit. He didn't travel down into the, into the congregation. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't leave the pulpit. But he used words that were so a mile long. And you had no idea what he was saying. So he, he may have just been able, he might as well have just been speaking you know, a foreign language. It must have been, to me, it's tongues. Because if you can't understand what the man's saying, then you've got a problem going on there. But a few years ago, I was at camp. And I, we were on a break, and then the kids were all shooting basket, the basketballs on the court and what have you. And I was sitting there, I was sitting close to these, these group of college boys that were talking. And they were all seminary students, and, and they were talking some stuff, and I, got new, I, I had no idea what they were saying. I didn't have a clue what they were talking about. And I remember sitting there thinking, now a little bit of me was jealous that I didn't understand what they were talking about. I thought, man, I wish I could have gone to seminary, da, da, da. But then my next thought was, I pray they don't take that into the pulpit. Because if they take it into the pulpit, there's, not, there's no one going to understand what they're saying. Maybe they're professor, but that's about it. I pray they don't do that. Paul had a way of speaking. And over in 1 Corinthians, Paul reveals his philosophy about speaking. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 9, it says, So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. So be clear about what you're saying. Speak in a, in a language and in a, at a level that your audience can understand. And in the 19th verse, Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Through the years, people have been very kind in their comments about my preaching. I don't consider myself to be all that great of a preacher, but probably the greatest comment or compliment I think I ever got was I had a person come to me after a, a sermon one, one day, and they said to me, I understood everything you said. Isn't that the purpose? Amen. Isn't that the purpose? Amen. And so, you know, you want to make sure that whenever you're standing in the pulpit, when you're standing in a rostrum, you're teaching a class, you're preaching, whatever, you're witnessing to people. You want to speak in a language that they understand. All right? Over in, the, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 13, Paul said this, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You're not going to win the world with, with uh, the words of men. If you want to preach the, uh, the word of God, then preach the word of God. If you want to see the lost come to Christ, if you want to see the believer be encouraged, then preach the word. Don't try to dazzle them with enticing words of men. In verse 2, But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Paul and Barnabas had experienced a great reception to the word. The Bible says a great multitude of the Jews and also of the Greeks believed. But not everyone present believed in the gospel that they preached. So here's another pattern of ministry. You can preach your heart out. You can teach with all the skill in the world. 
You can witness until the cows come home and there will still be those that will not believe. All we can do is prepare, pray, and present. It's up to them to have the faith to believe. So here we find those who were unbelieving Jews and they began to create opposition for Paul and Barnabas. I find it odd. It's interesting to me that how those who, who don't have any time for God, they don't believe in God, they refuse to acknowledge he even exists, how that they have to involve themselves in opposition to the gospel. Why would you oppose something that you don't believe in? You don't believe exists. Why would you want to engage in any kind of conversation? You don't believe there's a God, so why are you opposing him? Well, you know what that tells me? It tells me that you have an innate knowledge that God exists. And that you want, you have this, because Satan is driving it up in you, that you want to go and contend with God Almighty. What a foolish thing. Throughout the world, it's always, it's always intrigued me. You know, why are you getting so upset? I believe in Jesus Christ, and, and you don't. I understand that. But why are you getting all red in the face? Why are you, you spitting all over me and all this? Why are you getting so upset? If you don't believe it, then that's between you and him. So why would it bother you what I believe? You know? Well, I can tell you why. I, I just truly believe that, that man has an innate sense that there is a God, and they don't want to be held accountable. They don't want to stand before him in judgment. I think it scares them, and when they get scared, they get angry. So we find here that these unbelieving Jews begin to uh, create opposition uh, for Paul and Barnabas. In this case, the unbelievers were successful in their attempt to stir up the people. Luke states that the unbelievers had made their minds evil, affected against the brethren. These troublemakers were able to trouble the minds within the community in such a way that they rejected Paul and Barnabas. Here's an example of spiritual warfare. That is, uh, Satan is always lurking. Uh, around the church. As soon as the church strikes a blow against evil, it seems as if Satan is always present to try and undo any progress that has been made. Satan's attempts to disrupt do not always come from without the church. What I would tell you, probably his most damaging uh, uh, attack comes usually from within the church. Some of us were talking the other night, and I told him that uh, I need to begin to uh, prepare uh, this church, this congregation, for the spiritual warfare that's coming. A matter of fact, I personally believe it's already here. I know that Satan's already been uh, coming at me. I suspect he's probably coming at some of you because here's what I believe. I believe in 2022, when I have the time to put my, my full time and, and effort and heart into this ministry, that we're going to grow. I believe that. And you know what I also believe? I believe Satan believes it. Yes, he does. That's what I believe. And I can tell you right now that because he believes that, he's coming after us. He's coming after you, 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 you. He's coming after every one of us. Why? Because he doesn't want to see this church grow. He doesn't want to see this church be healthy. He doesn't want to see this church be a Bible-believing, uh, fundamental uh, church. He doesn't want to see that. He wants to see us discouraged. He wants to see us divided. He wants to see us frustrated. He wants to see us anger and bitter. That's what he's after. And we have to prepare ourselves, because I'm telling you right now, uh, the day that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were strapping on your boots and you were stepping out onto the field of battle. A field of battle, by the way, where there's already been blood shed and there's blood still being shed today. And if you dare step out into that battle without your sword being the word of God, then that's the act of a fool. And we'll get into that just a little bit here about how you defeat Satan. But for people who are not, listen to me, if you are not reading your Bible, if you are not praying, if you are not studying, if you're not coming to church, if you're not doing the things that you need to do to equip yourself for the battle that you're, if you're not already in it, you're getting ready to be in it because it's coming. That's a foolish thing to do. You know, when I joined the Army back in 78, you know what they did? They took us to basic training. And, you know, one of the things that they do in, in basic training is they strip you of your individuality. That's why that drill sergeant's in your face yelling at you, cussing at you, doing all these things. And they try to break you down. And then they try to build you up as a unit. And you know what they do? They teach you how to fight. They teach you how to fight because even though when I was in, we weren't at war, but they were preparing us for the war to come. They took us to the rifle range. They taught us how to load our weapon, how to load it and, and, and to take aim and engage a target and how to shoot that weapon. 
They taught us how to uh, arm and disarm mines. They taught us how to use a, a thing called a claymore mine, which is a devastating <laughs> weapon. They taught us how to prepare for battle. God's word will prepare you for battle. And please, listen to me. Do not think that you are above or beyond Satan's assault. Do not make this mistake that to think that, well, I'm such a good Christian that Satan won't have any power on me. Oh, he's already got you. He's already got you. I've made that mistake in my life. Every time I would think that, boy, me and Jesus, we are like that. There ain't no room for anyone to get in there. Then I'd mess up. Every time. Every time. So don't, don't make that mistake. We should always be preparing for the battle that uh, uh, we're engaged in or we're coming for, uh, whatever, because Satan is not going to yield his assault. Verse 3. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So Luke says that Paul and Barnabas, they stuck around in Iconium for a long time. Now, there, while they remained there, they, be, they continued to speak boldly in the Lord. And I want us to fully grasp exactly what was going on here. The unbelievers had stirred up the people against Paul and Barnabas, but they didn't allow their lack of popularity to impede their ministry. Listen, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're, if you're trying to get into ministry to be popular or whatever, I got news for you. you you're in the wrong business. It doesn't work that way. Uh, God had also granted the apostles... The, this, uh, the apostolic signs and wonders, uh, the ability to heal the sick or cast out demons, was granted by God, if you will, as a, as a validation that these men had been uh, called by God, ordained by God, sent by God. In verse 4, And the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lieth round about. So where we read in chapter 8 that how that the city in Samaria, Samaria when they had received the gospel, that uh, the city was filled with great joy uh, because of the gospel. Here in Iconium, the city is divided. We need to be aware when we begin to present the gospel of Jesus Christ that there's going to be division. There's going to be those who do not believe. There's going to be some that will. And the ones that don't are from various levels are going to oppose that message. Any group that becomes divided becomes stressed. People who are stressed can begin to be angry, can begin to be bitter, and from this, can violence can erupt. Among the opposition Iconium were those who had decided that they would stone Paul. Just as we uh, see today, when the unbelieving people cannot contend with the word of God, they then choose to silence it or attempt to silence the word of God. Here, the people were so intent on silencing the word of God that they were going to stone to death his minister. And we see that in the world today. We have missionaries being murdered in an attempt to silence the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it's not working. It's not working. Paul and Barnabas, being made aware of the plans against them, decided to flee the city. And so they traveled 30, 40 miles uh, to Lystra and Derby. And Jesus, who had made it clear in John chapter 15 how the world would re re react to us as followers, Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Is your desire this morning to be popular in the world? Is that what you want? Look, I get it. You know, nobody wants to be unpopular. Nobody, nobody likes constant uh, contention and opposition. It's not that necessarily we, we, we uh, uh, savor it. But can I give you a warning? If you're popular in the world today, if you have influence in the world today, if the world doesn't contend with you, then maybe you're too worldly. Maybe you're too worldly. P 
people should when they look at you. It shouldn't take them too often long to realize there's something different about that person. Oh, they're a Christian. There is going to be people who will not like you simply because you're a Christian. They don't care about your personality. They don't care about your position. In the community. They don't care about any of that. They're just going to dislike you simply because you're a Christian. And we need to be uh, aware of that and not surprised by it when opposition comes. No matter how upsetting it may be to be ill-treated uh, by the world, and, and, and the world is our family and our friends, co-workers, it should never surprise us. Not if you're following Jesus. Satan is going to use every trick in the book to try to get you to stumble. When Satan comes, though, we have the tools to defeat him. Not, listen, we don't have to play around with Satan. We don't have to wrestle around with Satan. We can defeat him. In the fourth chapter of Matthew, after Jesus had been baptized, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. In the fourth verse of that fourth chapter, Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And here he gave us an example of how to defeat Satan. In the fourth chapter of James, we read where Jesus' half-brother instructed believers in this manner. In the seventh verse, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We don't have to be in the Satan's presence. Submit yourself to God, resist him, and he'll flee. And then and again in Exodus... We read the word of Moses of the children of Israel. They stood on the far bank of the Red Sea. They had just parted on dry ground, and, and the sea had been parted for them. Then they're standing there, and they can see Pharaoh's army bearing down on them. And there's this fear that's beginning to ripple through the congregation. And they're standing in there, and they're all thinking, what in the world do we do? And Moses says, stand still. For fear not, stand still. All right? Sometimes we have to wait on God. Sometimes it's just like, hey, don't be fearful. God's got it, but we've got to wait on him. We've got to wait on him to tell us which direction to go, how to handle this. Because in that 13th verse, when Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. When God takes care of something, he takes care of it forever. So in the 39th chapter of Genesis... We read about Joseph being sold into slavery and landing in the house of Potiphar. And as we know, Potiphar's wife had made several advances towards Joseph, all of which he had refused. But then one day Joseph came into the house and there was no other servants around. Uh, the house was empty, just him and Potiphar's wife. And she tried to seduce him. And Potiphar fled from her presence, but, he left, but she had grabbed his outer garment and left it behind. So he fled. So among these few verses, the Bible teaches us very clearly how to have victory over Satan. First is to fight Satan with the word of God. Satan cannot overcome the word of God. Amen? Amen. In the book of James, we're taught to submit to the Lord and resist Satan, and he will flee from you. You don't have to be in Satan's presence. All right? Resist him. Drive him away. In Exodus, we learn from Moses that there are times when we just have to fear not and to stand still. There are times we simply have to wait on God to direct. And then in Genesis, in the account of Joseph, we learn that there comes times when we simply must run. Get away from Satan. Get away from his evil influence. Maybe you have a particular weakness, and maybe you get in the presence of others that have that particular weakness, and they're, not, they're unbelievers or whatever, and you know that I don't belong here. I need to get up and I need to go. Folks, there was times when I was in the service, there's been times with my friends at work and all this other stuff where I've just had to get up and go. Because I didn't need to be around that influence. In Iconium, we read how Paul and Barnabas initially stayed the course, remaining in the city and preaching the gospel boldly. When circumstances became too hazardous for the gospel to prosper, they fled Iconium and went into Lystra and Derby, but they stayed their course. Verse 7 says, and there they preached the gospel. 
each week I try to listen to two, maybe three sermons or whatever topic I'm preaching on just to see what other preachers are saying and try to pick up on a point here and there. And, and one preacher made a point this week that I thought was interesting. He said that, you know, because of the contention that had risen in the city, uh, had they not left, then that would have all been uh, reflected upon the local church. And his idea was that, that Paul and Barnabas, their fleeing, was to take some of the pressure off the local uh, people that were going to have to remain there. But time and time again, Paul and Barnabas would be chased out of one city and then the next. But they never ceased to do what God had called them to do, preach the gospel. While in Lystra, Paul and Barnabas would experience yet another tactic of Satan's to derail their ministry. Pride. Pride. In verse 8 we read, And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet, and he leaped and walked. Coming upon a man who was paralyzed and had been, had been from birth, Paul recognized that this man had the faith to be healed, and so he does exactly that. He heals him, and the man gets up and he walks. So you can imagine this begins to create, create quite a stir among the people because they would have known this man, they would have known him from birth, they would have known his condition, and they would have known that they just witnessed a genuine miracle. And so they were excited. In verse 11, And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. So the people are all excited, but during their excitement, they begin to claim that Paul and Barnabas were gods and that they had been sent to them in the flesh. They are so convinced by this that the, the priest of Jupiter, so evidently the temple, the temple of Jupiter was, was uh, fairly close by. He gathered those items necessary to offer a sac sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas as gods. This would have been the perfect opportunity for Paul and Barnabas' pride to kick in, for them to elevate themselves in the community, for them to maybe uh, use this to garner uh, wealth and, and fame and all these other things. Uh, but instead, they rushed into the crowd where they tore their robes, which is a sign of great distress. They began to tell the people that they were men just like they were. They said, there's nothing special about us. We're just here to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why would you do such a thing? And he goes, uh, they tell them that they weren't gods to be worshipped. In fact, Paul told them that they should put away their vanities, this worship of these gods, because that word vanity means something that's empty. What you're doing, the, what you're worshipping, it's all empty. It's not going to come to any good. And, to, and turn instead to the living God. Addressing the crowd about the true God, Paul referenced the fact that God had created the heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. So Paul goes on to make the point that God had provided a witness of himself in nature. Paul would later write in Romans in the first chapter in the 20th verse, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. He's saying to him, you already know these things. These are things that you have experienced with. These are things that you know for a fact exist. Somebody, somebody had to create them. Someone had to uh, design them. Only through Paul's impassioned pleas were they able to restrain the crowd from making sacrifices unto them. However, the devotion shown by these people is going to be short-lived. Here they want to worship him as gods, and then look what happens next. Verse 19 and there came thither certain Jews from Antioch. So it wasn't good enough for these Jews to contend with them in Antioch. They're going to follow them in Iconia, Iconium and to, to create uh, trouble. And I will tell you, this, listen, I've witnessed this. I've experienced this. People that uh, want to create trouble will follow you from place to place. I've seen it done. I've seen it done. Who persuaded the people and, having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing that he had been de dead. Now, there are those scholars that will tell you that Paul did die. I, don't, I'm, I can't uh, say that because it says that he, they supposed he was dead. How fickle can people be? One minute they're praising him as God, and the next they're stoning him to death. So if, you're, if your idea is to, to try to uh, be able to uh, gather a popularity or, or position or power or whatever, it's short-lived, I promise you. I promise you that. I've uh, recently commented to Karen several times how I would not want to be in the public eye. 
Uh, one of the things that I pay attention, I watch a little bit of football these days, not nearly as much as I used to, but one of the things that, that kind of turns me off about all sports is the way the media treats these. These are young men, you know, 21, 22 years of age. And they bring them in, they hail them as the savior of an organization. And after game one or game two, they're all over them. You know, they, 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 they throw an interception or they didn't win the game or whatever the case may be. So they go from being uh, the town hero to the town goat, and I don't mean greatest of all time, in just a matter of, of weeks, if not uh, shorter. These men and women were about to do sacrifice unto Paul and Barnabas, and in just a short time, they can be guided by unbelievers and stirred to the point where they want to kill them. When I warn you about spiritual warfare, I'm telling you, I have witnessed it in this church. I have witnessed where uh, people have gone to those within the church. And I know some of these people, and I know that they, they have a temper. And all these people had to do was go and begin to start pushing the right buttons, and that temper would flare up. So I've seen it done. It's an effective means that Satan uses. And what I'm telling you this morning is you pay attention. Because when Satan begins to try to push your button, you need to just push him aside. Submit yourself to God and, and Satan will flee from you. Because what we're getting ready to, the endeavor that we're getting ready to engage is going to be earth changing. It's going to be life changing to this church. We got to roll up our sleeves and we got to get busy. There's going to have to be sacrifices made. Sacrifices of time, money, energy, whatever. Popularity. Because I will promise you, when this church begins to grow like it can, Satan is going to come at you with everything he has. And I don't want to see people wringing their hands and throwing their hands up in the air and saying, I'm done. Because they ran into someone that opposed them. What you ought to do whenever that happens is you just praise God. I must be doing something right. Mm -hmm. the, world's, the world's got a problem with me. I want the world to have a problem with me. I want them to. It's not that I, I invite confrontation or, or uh, want to be fighting with someone all the time. I don't. It's tiring. It's, it robs you of your energy and all this other stuff. But I want them to understand that I'm not going to move. I'm not going to get out of their way because they want to silence the gospel. That's not going to happen. And that needs to be the stance that you take. This is what I believe. And I can tell you how to come to one who, who can uh, save your soul, give you peace, give you joy in this life and the life to come. If you're in the ministry, and by the way, when I say that, I'm talking to all of us. I'm not, I don't mean me. I don't mean a deacon. I'm talking about if you've confessed Jesus Christ because you've all been called to be witnesses of Jesus Christ to the world. So you're involved in ministry. So you're going to run into evil opposition. People are going to lie about you. People are going to take something innocent and turn it into something uh, devastating. And you're going to have to be able to withstand that, to be able to, to pass through and drive through all that. In verse 20, <clears throat> How be it, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city. So Paul has been stoned. They think he's dead. Now he's getting up. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel into that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, mm -hmm. confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that, he must be, that we must, uh, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Get what happened? People like Conan, they stoned him. Dragged him outside the city like a piece of garbage, thinking he was dead. He got up and he walked back into the city. The next day he went somewhere, but you know what he did when he got to the next town? He continued to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And not only that, but after he was done presenting it in these new places, he turned around and he repeated, uh, went back into the cities that he had just came from. He went back into Iconium, the place where they had put him to death. And why? Because he wanted to confirm the souls of his brothers and sisters and to encourage them not to give up, not to lose faith. 
to maintain the mission of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, to save their neighbor, to save that neighbor that's standing there with a stone in their hand, to save them. Man, what an example Paul is. I think that, man, if someone had stoned me like that, I don't know that I'd be going back. I, you know, I, I don't know. First guy I saw with a stone, I'd be turning around and getting out of there. But Paul went back. Why? Because his concern for the lost and for his brothers and sisters was so overwhelming, he wasn't going to be concerned about his personal safety. And so he went in there and confirmed them. I will tell you that in the days and weeks, months to come, we're going to have to confirm one another. That in the eyes of opposition, we're going to have to stand still. Paul made it clear to the church in Iconium, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. It would be foolish to think that we were going to be able to go peacefully along this journey. If we're living for Christ, we will suffer tribulation. Listen, if you got it in your head somewhere, someone uh, painted a rosy picture that, you know, hey, if you come to Jesus, if you accept him as Lord and Savior, everything will be okay. That's a lie of Satan. That's a lie that is designed for the first time that you stub your toe for you to quit. That's what that's designed to do. That as soon as you run into some opposition, someone who doesn't want to hear your testimony, someone who doesn't want to hear that you go to church, someone who doesn't want to be invited to church, for you to throw up your hands and go, well, I'm done, because this, this should be a peaceful journey. It's not. It's not. It's not for the weak of heart. One of the things that I've witnessed through the years is people not wanting responsibility in the church. And you know why? Because they don't want to deal with the people. They don't want to deal with the people. Pastor, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this, but just whatever you do, just don't put me in charge. I don't want to be responsible for that ministry. I don't want to be responsible for that class or that outreach or whatever. I don't want the responsibility. And why is that? Because they don't want to be the target of criticism. Well, why would they be criticized? Huh? Huh? Can I tell you my experience, you know, I'm getting a little long in the tooth as far as ministry goes now. I mean, I'm coming up on year 15 here as far as being a pastor, that my experience has been it's the people that do not have their hands in the dirt of the ministry, actively engaged, actively working, participating, praying, and, and planning, and, and executing those plans. It's the ones that are sitting over here on the sidelines. Those are the ones that tend to complain because they don't have a clue. They don't have a clue. They're not willing to admit that, well, you know, something can go not according to plan. You can have the best plans in the world, and then there's a hiccup. Well, what do you do? Do you quit? No, you don't quit. You just drive on. Drive through it. Keep pressing on. The music dies out, then you sing a cappella. Amen? Amen. We're going to be asked to sing some a cappella in the coming year. There's no doubt in my mind. It might not be pretty. Because if I'm singing a cappella, it's not going to be pretty. But it'll be steadfast. And that's what we've got to be. We've got to be steadfast in the Lord. From here, Paul and Barnabas, they traveled through Pisidia, Pamphylia, Perga, and Antelia, where they continued to preach the word, and then they returned to the church at Antioch. And then when they got back to the church at Antioch, they gave testimony. They... Uh, Specifically, they spoke about how the door had been opened to the Gentiles. And they were excited about that. And they were able to instill in the next week or whenever the Lord uh, uh, wills, will go into the conference that's held at Jerusalem to uh, address the differences in some of the teachings that were taking place. So Paul and Barney, uh, Barnabas had completed an arduous journey. Along the way, they had been persecuted, exiled, and stoned and left for dead. But when they returned to Antioch at Syria and stood before the church, they testified about all that God had done. They didn't do that as defeated missionaries. They did that as victor victorious soldiers of Jesus. They weren't focused on, man, that, that really, they really got me in Iconium, man. They, they had me, left me for dead. That was a bummer. Now, he may have shared the facts of the thing, but I think what they focused on 
was that, but you know what? We had hundreds come to the Lord. And there's a strong church in Iconium now. And we went back and, and confirmed their souls. And we encouraged them. And they're doing the Lord's work. And I think that's what energized them and that's what got them excited. As members of truth, there's a lot of work ahead of us. There's going to be trials. There's going to be tribulations. And there's going to be many, many opportunities to be discouraged, to quit. But if we will persist, we will see victory. This St. Paul who suffered many indignations throughout his ministry. He wrote this to the Galatians in the, third, or in the sixth chapter, the ninth verse. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if, if we faint not. If we faint not. Folks, I don't have all the answers. Matter of fact, sometimes I feel like I don't have any of the answers. Paul says there's coming a day where we're going to reap if we faint not. If we faint not. Now, I don't know if you've been paying attention, but the spirit in this church has been good for months now. A strong, sweet spirit. And we're not having hordes of people come in here yet. But the numbers are rising. All right? And I will tell you that if we will be faithful to do his work, to do his will, that we will see, number one, and again, I want to stress this always, is that the goal is to grow the kingdom of God. Listen, if we lead someone to the Lord and they decide to go to the grove next Sunday, praise God. Praise God. If we lead someone to the Lord and they go to, to Park Avenue, praise God. Because we're growing the kingdom. We may not be able to worship with that person here on earth at, at truth. But we're going to worship with them in heaven forever. And that's what matters. That's what matters. What do you consider a successful ministry? I consider a successful ministry one that teaches the truth of the gospel. That's what I consider successful. The numbers are nice. And, and I'm like any, any, probably any one of you. I would love to see these pews packed. I would like to, I look forward to the day when someone comes up to me and says, Pastor, we've got to do something about the AC. It just can't keep it cool in here with 200 people in this room. Yes. Amen. Won't that be a great day to say, well, we're going to have to go get a bigger unit up there, you know, and crank it up. Or the day that someone walks up and says, you know what, we might have to consider two services. Numbers are nice. They're nice. I like meeting new people. I, like, I love having a church family. I love uh, having a good church family. But I want to see us be a church that where we're all strong in the word of God and we're seeing people come to Christ. We're seeing our young people grow in the love and admonition of the Lord and to see them grow up and going onto the mission fields and filling pulpits and, and, and uh, uh, entering into uh, marital covenants that are godly. That's what I want to see. I don't know about you, but, you know, one of the things I, I used to tell Karen all the time, says, you know, I don't want to waste my life. At the end of my life, I don't want to look back and say, man, I wasted it. You know what? I, I think about, listen, I've had time to think about death over the last couple of years. And one of the things that I want to be able to do is lay there and I want to be able to recount, well, this person, man, this person's out on the mission field or this person's pastoring over here or this couple's over here. One of the great joys that I have is, is, uh, uh, Ashley and her husband, I see them on Facebook all the time, and they, they just seem to be happy as two peas in a pod, and I get such joy out of that. I told the church on Thursday night, I got a phone call, and I'll try to make this fast. I got a phone call Monday, I was out walking, and my phone rang, and it was the second time this number had popped up, 
And I thought, well, I better answer it because I'll just, you know, I forget sometimes that I got the church phone forwarded to my phone. And uh, so I answered, and there's a voice on the other end, and this voice is all, you know, excited and, and uh, says, uh, hey, uh, is this, is this Daryl? I said, yeah. He says, you, you, you and I used to have conversations about 10 years ago. He said, matter of fact, we used to debate one another. And I'm thinking, man, I have no idea who this is. And he said, I'm calling you to tell you that you are 100% right. And I said, so I don't know about me being 100% right. I said, but who am I talking to? And, he's, and he says, oh, that makes it even better that you don't know who this is. <laughs> but he was so excited. And now I'm getting excited. Yeah. He said, this is, and he told me his name. And I said, no way. He says, well, I called to tell you that I'm walking with the Lord. Amen. And I'm going through seminary. Yes. Amen. And and you've heard, me t you've heard me talk about this guy. You don't know him by name, but you've heard me use him as an illustration in the pulpit before. When I first hired him, we were talking, and, and you know, he was telling me he was a Christian. So I had asked him where he went to church, and he said, oh, I don't go down there you know, with all them people. They do this, and they do that, and all this. And, and I just looked at him and said, well, why don't you go down and lead them? Why don't you go down and lead them? If you've got all the answers, why, don't you, why aren't you leading the church? And he just kind of stopped and stared at me. And then I just turned around and walked away. You know, I'm like, man, if you got all the answers, go do it. Don't just sit here and complain about it. So he called to tell me. He says, man, he goes, sometimes I think about some of the things I said to you, and my skin just crawls. I said, man, I, go, I can't even remember what you said to me. I said, but I am so excited to hear that you're walking with the Lord. And I, was, I, felt, I felt, you know, I was like I said, I, was out on my, I felt like I started walking on clouds. And those are the things that will energize you in life. Those are the things that will encourage you. Because um, there's still people out there getting saved, and there's still people out there looking to do the Lord's work, and there's still people out there excited about what lies ahead. I want us as a church to be excited about what lies ahead. Be excited about going to the grocery store because God might put someone in your path. Be excited about just smiling at someone and being kind so that their day is brighter. Be excited about being a, a follower of Jesus. There's a pattern to ministry. There's a pattern that whenever we experience great victories, we're going to face opposition. And I want us to be aware of that. Because the opposition, truly, you know what it is? It's a testimony to our faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And we just need to look at it that way. We need to look at it. I'm Pastor D. And I pastor Truth Free Will Baptist Church at 5311 Barna Avenue, right here in Titusville, Florida. And I just want to take a moment to thank you for tuning in and listening to our sermon this morning. And uh, just to encourage you that if you were unable to be with us in person today, that uh, we would like for you to prayerfully consider being with us uh, in service next Sunday. Our services on Sundays are 9 o'clock. We have Sunday school. At 10 o'clock is our worship service. And then on our midweek service is on Thursdays. We start at 6 o'clock with something we call Pizza with the Pastor, and that's uh, where moms and dads can come in with their young people, and they can uh, have pizza together so you don't have to cook, you don't have to rush around, uh, you have plenty of time to come in, have a, have a decent dinner, and then go on into our time of uh, worship and fellowship. And then, uh, so at uh, 6.30, the adults, we retire into the sanctuary where we have our adult Bible study. Uh, we call that Foundations in Faith. So I just want to ask you to consider uh, being in church next week, if you're un unable to attend in person, or maybe you haven't been uh, because of all the recent uh, in events and challenges that we've had in this world, but uh, I want to encourage you, get up. Uh, if you have a home church, go there, be there, enjoy your fellowship with your brothers and sisters. If you don't, then uh, please prayerfully consider Truth Free Will Baptist Church uh, in your future. And so uh, I trust that this sermon was uh, an encouragement to you. If uh, by all means, if uh, you're looking for some spiritual guidance. You want to uh, develop that relationship with God, and uh, you need some uh, help with that. You can always give us a call here at the church. Our phone number is 321-269-4033, and be more than happy to talk with you about your spiritual needs. And then uh, also, if this uh, ministry has been a blessing to you, we would like to ask you to consider to making an offering uh, to us uh, to help that ministry along. And then uh, you can go and visit our website at truthfwbc.com. And if you scroll to the bottom of that page, there's a, 
uh, a button there where if you so choose, you can uh, donate to our ministry. So I thank you for that consideration. And then again, we're so glad that you were able to uh, tune in with us this morning. And I trust again that the sermon uh, touched your heart and that you were uh, encouraged as a result of it. Uh, trust that you have a good week. We'll be praying for you. God bless.